We are here to do a book review on The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss by Dennis McKenna. And Dennis is the brother to the most influential psychedelic advocate of all time, Terrence McKenna. And him and Terrence's life were very intertwined almost until the end of Terrence's life. And he died a very early death. And Dennis is just as responsible as Terrence is for help bringing psychedelics into modern consciousness, which has helped some psychedelics become decriminalized and starting to be more researched in medical facilities. Dennis is now a PhD professor at the University of Minnesota where he teaches ethnopharmacology. And I actually met Dennis McKenna and he signed my book and he was super cool to me. I, I was like 21 years old and I was at this spiritual woo-woo conference and, and he was a speaker but I thought he would just be speaking and leaving. And I get to the conference early that day and I see that he's there with a booth selling um, selling books. And I'm like, oh my God, it's Dennis McKenna. This guy changed my life. This guy, him and his brother gave me the confidence to do psychedelics and do a bunch of other stuff. Wow. So I walk up to him and I buy a book and he signs it and I'm talking to him. And I expect like, you know, the usual author thing like, hey, how you doing? Well, cool. And like kind of turning away. And I expected other people to come up, but no one seemed to know who he was. Over the next three hours, him and I just started talking because he was bored. You know, he didn't have a phone with him. He's in his 70s. So I'm sitting in like basically doing a podcast with Dennis McKenna and four people came up to him to the booth. Only one knew who he was and he just um, came and went in like a couple minutes and the other people had no idea who he was. So I talked with Dennis McKenna and he was a really chill guy and him and his brother exemplify equality that is so important that so many people in the psychedelic community lack and even in the spiritual community lack. And that is a groundedness in real world action at some point in your life. Because I understand that there is a time in life where you need to go deep into your mind, into meditation, into psychedelics, into whatever spiritual modality that you need to go into. Our world is very painful and there's maybe a lot of healing that needs to be done. And that may take years, it may take a decade, probably no more than that though. And once that's over with, it's then that person's responsibility to embark on the great work and start trying to heal the world in the most potent way that they can, to start enacting their divine purpose, which is basically their unique calling to contribute to others from the infinite reservoir of love and cre creativity within them. However, a lot of people never leave that hedonistic pleasure land. And I call it the my enlightenment movement. I know so many spiritual people, so many people who take psychedelics and they only start caring about their enlightenment, their journey. They haven't maybe figured out or wanted to acknowledge that when one suffers, we all suffer. And I am me and you are, excuse me, you are me and I am you. And with enough practice with obtaining mystical states, you can probably reach a level where you can feel that. And once you understand that, you have the choice to either accept that and do something or reject it. And people who reject it spend their whole life living a lie, living, I would say, a very painful existence. But Terrence and his brother, Dennis, never so came to that. And I don't know what it is about certain people, if it's the parents or the school, if it's just random luck. But when you start to read this, you know, biography, or excuse me, this autobiography of Dennis and Terrence's life, you could tell from an early age that they were interested in books. And that's really the, the, the separating factor. If we look at MLK, Malcolm X, Gandhi, most real leaders, most people that make an actual change, they are very deep and entrenched in education for at least some portion of their life. And then another portion of life, they're actually very entrenched in a very spiritual thing. If we look at Martin Luther, Luther King with Christianity, Malcolm X with, um, the nation of Islam, Gandhi with Hinduism, any other major figure you can imagine, the Buddha. They also have a very, you know, academic education, but then of course the more irrational religious or spiritual education. And when you read this book, you realize how deep Terence and Dennis's education went. It went into psychology, philosophy, of course, biology and all the sciences. And that's how they created later on because anyone can go and take psychedelics, maybe not anyone, but it's pretty easy to go take psychedelics in South America or wherever and you know gain some experiences. But it's very hard to know what to do with that information. And in their book, that is Terence and Dennis's book, The Invisible Landscape, they're the first chapter in, the, in this book, and it's one of the most important books on psychedelics psychedelics of all time. They start to explain when you take a deep dose of psychedelics, you become a complex schizophrenic because you go somewhere and you have visions and you go through all the stuff that you can't really explain or have a referent or compare to this reality. It has no basis or meaning in this reality, not really. But you can transition into a simple schizophrenic when you can take some of that information and make it potent or or useful in in the in this reality. And a lot of people don't do that. They're just going on trips and having feelings and they're putting themselves in these hyper suggestible space and rocketing to the moon, but they're never using and realizing that these drugs are not these recreational things. They are an instant vision quest with years even of information just in one trip to unpack and do. I, I just this year alone, I'm still unpacking and fulfilling visions from psychedelic trips from nine years ago. There are certain things that are still coming to fruition in like 
come stemming out of my, getting pulled out of my subconscious that I saw myself doing nine years ago, but now I have the confidence and the being and the ability to do them. And that's the message really of this channel. That's why I say, you know, we we're trying to harmonize pen and sword. The law of the law of attraction ends when you get the intuition for action. All the law of attraction does is bring you to the door, bring you to the place where then you have to step into that reality, step into that vibe, and then live out the energy that that you've been gifted or maybe just realized or tuned into. And of course, because this is a book channel, I'd like to talk about Terence and Dennis's love for the psychoanalytical thinker, Carl Jung. And I guess we should talk about some of the other influences before I dive, go on my big Carl Jung rant. Quote, in the early 60s, we loved the old school giants, Asimov, Theodore Sturgeon, Robert Heinlein, Ray Bradbury, and especially Arthur C. Clarke. And Terence and Dennis were also very much influenced by the anti, the more rebellious aspect of The Catcher in the Rye and Anne Rand's works. And if you look, once again, a lot of influencers, a lot of the big impactors of society had go through a very objective period where they're, you know, more libertarian or more anti, go through a very anti-authoritarian phase. And they're, you know, another quality that Terrence and Dennis have, a lot of other thinkers, they are very big picture. They're not focused on the details. They're not stuck in nitty gritty land. They are focusing on the big picture and trying to make innovation. So one of Jung's really big ideas that he pushed was synchronicity. And we hear about this all the time in the spiritual community about synchronicity. But Jung was a scientist. And that's, I guess that's another thing that makes the McKenna's and Jung, like Carl Jung, look at him. He is a one of the most influential thinkers of all time. Very similar story. Went through a very academic period of his life then had a very spiritual part of his life, then finally integrated that all together, tapped into his unconscious and released and evolved Western thought forever. But one of Jung's ideas was that how we feel on the inside is really influences the outside world. And you know, that may seem a little bit woo. When we start tapping into synchronicities, you start really trying, you start really exploring the inner and the outer world because anyone that has opened themselves up to synchronicities starts to understand that there are cracks in this reality, especially cracks in the objective reality model. I have gone through so many synchronicity experiences that are I infinitely impossible. Maybe not impossible, but the, if because I've had so many, they are almost reaching the realm of it's like one in hundreds of billions of a chance of actually happening. Just a couple weeks ago, here's an example. I woke up, I was feeling a little bit weird. I was, I'm, I'm gonna be moving in a couple months. So I was organizing some books, putting them all in some boxes. And I came across this book that I thought I lost. I think it was called, I think it's called the Pixar Touch. And it's about like the formation of Pixar. So I read through, I read, so I sit down for like five hours and just read through it. And it goes over like the history of Pixar. And of course, and it stopped in like 2007 or something, the book when it was published. So like the last chapter was on Monsters, Inc. So as soon as I was done with that, I hear my cat go, Row! and I look over and I'm like, oh, hey, hey, Orpheus, what's up? And I'm like, oh, he's hungry. So I, it's time to feed him. I've been reading like crazy. He needs to eat. So I go and look and there's no cat food. So I'm like, crap. So I asked my roommate, and I'm like, hey, do you want to go get some cat food? I'm going, they're like, yeah, sure. So we're driving and suddenly this motorcycle, and I'm, I'm telling them, I'm telling them about the book and I'm, I'm, and I say, I'm at the, kind of get to the end. I'm telling them about Monsters, Inc. And how it got, it took like months to render the film. And this motorcycle just veers in, thrown in front of me and I slam on my brakes like this. I haven't had that close of a call in four or five years, maybe ever in my life. And this motorcycle slams in front of me and then hits his brakes and I hit my brakes and we come to a stop at this light. And you know, I'm like a little bit flustered. I'm like, what the hell? And then I look at this motorcyclist helmet and on the back of the helmet, there was a mon there's a Monsters Inc. sticker. We start at the very start. What were the chances of me finding this book that had been, I thought had been totally lost for a couple of years? And me deciding to read it. Me deciding to read it made me have to leave because of my cat because I didn't feed him earlier and realized I didn't have cat food. So I leave. My roommate was just happened to be outside at that very time. We're already starting to, the probabilities are always starting to, starting to, you know, belt out. I almost get into a car accident with the motorcyclist, like one I've never gotten into in years. Never had that close of a call. And I drive every single day. I was just telling this guy at that very instant about Monsters, Inc. And what was on this motorcyclist helmet? He could have anything on his helmet, nothing. There are a billion variations of stickers. I mean, probably at least millions of stickers out there that he could have had, could have had on the back of his helmet. So we, you know what I mean? We're now at this very wide and crazy space of synchronicity. And I could just blow that off. But when I add up a bunch of other um, since situations like that in my life, they're actually even crazier than that one. And if th those are totaling over a hundred, maybe I have something here and you have the same things happen. And a lot of people just never tap into it. A lot of people never even experience or know these things are going on because they don't believe in it or aren't looking at it. And Carl Jung, you know, it, obviously the idea of the art types and his ideas on crop circles and aliens and stuff were influential to the McKenna brothers. And he talks about that. But another one was that Carl Jung 
was an absolute fanatic about alchemy. And a lot of people think about alchemy, like what alchemy It's like turning lead into gold. And no, that was just a front that alchemists used. They were really searching for the philosopher's stone. And that is up to debate about what that really is. Some people say immortality, but a lot of people view it as a very, uh, a technological device that could do anything. And as we're moving closer with, we're moving with technology closer to that reality. But back in the seventies, Terrence McKenna and his brother, Dennis, thought that they could do this by quote, I thought we could build the philosopher's stone out of our own bodies, literally singing it into existence through a super conducting fusion of our own DNA with that of a mushroom. And that brings us to our next section that Terence and Dennis went to La Correra. I'm saying that wrong. It's a Peruvian place. And they started to experiment with tryptamines, one of the very first users of tryptamines, such as ayahuasca and DMT and very high doses of mushrooms. This is before the whole, everyone in South America became a shaman and everyone, you know, every yuppie and every person who was confused about their life and had no purpose went down there to take mushrooms or ayahuasca. And they went down there and spent months doing psychedelics, even going for one month without even leaving a tent, not going anywhere, spending a whole month just daily, just taking more and more and more and going to the limits of human consciousness. And Dennis went too far. And that's actually what happened that Dennis, I mean, this is really where this, these two start to diverge in story a little bit, that they were almost in unison. But Terrence took the drugs and had a more external approach. He was moving around a little bit more and really, I think, started to embody and realize his potential as the person that he became as a psychedelic advocate. But Dennis went really internal and went to the point where he couldn't speak or couldn't do things and was stuck even for weeks. And I think Terrence ended up leaving and moving and, you know, because he, he eventually Dennis got okay enough to speak or like do things, but he basically became totally internalized. And I've, I've had experiences like this on psychedelics at very high amounts, but I can't imagine taking extremely high amounts for over a month and with a tolerance, what that can do to you. And actually Terrence supposedly invented his time wave theory while he was on that huge month long trip. And that became a huge part of their teachings later on. So as you guys can see, my hair is all wet because there was a thunderstorm and I live in Las Vegas, the desert. So a thunderstorm is very, very rare. So I was outside running around having a great time, but I am back to finish this video. So right before the thunderstorm happened, I was actually just rereading the section. I read this book, um, reread this book the other day and I just read the section again about Terrence's death man and death is such a hard thing and Dennis you know as Terrence was dying had all these fantasies of them being able to take LSD or ayahuasca and cure the tumor in his brain and it's hard man we want to do these things we want to escape from death but the most important thing we can do is become more human so I recommend this book for everyone I think this is a great analysis if for any fans of Terrence McKenna probably you should look into the works of Terrence McKenna watch some YouTube lectures read some of his books dive into some of his theories start to if you're a psychedelic advocate this is just a good story this is a very based and good story on some of the ups and downs because T Dennis is not scared to say that he was wrong or that he was angry and there was a lot of tension between him and Terrence especially in the last 15 years of their life they were very angry at each other and had a lot of problems with each other and and he wasn't scared to say where he was wrong and Terrence was wrong and I think it's a very based perspective so if you guys like videos like this if you guys want some more spiritual videos like this that's why I put the spiritual intro let me know and I will make some more peace